fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We resume worship services on July 5th, regular times 8 and 10.30. There'll be an usher meeting on July 1st, Wednesday, to go over the guidelines for opening the um, church uh, for the communion service. Um, uh, you're asked to bring masks and six feet uh, social distancing. The pews will be marked where to sit six um, feet away from everyone. Hand sanitizers will be available. There's uh, guidelines in the newsletter, which is being mailed on Tuesday, the past Tuesday. And um, the ushers will be instructed what to do. It will be good to preach to a church with people and not empty pews. I got to tell you, these 15 weeks have been uh, interesting, but uh, I'll be glad when we get back and see members and um, have a regular service, as regular as we can. Capital campaign progress is uh, doing well. The insulated windows and insulated wall is progressing well. Uh, hopefully I'll get my office back when they finish their work there. Our thoughts and prayers continue with for Frank Mann with his health issues. Uh, Jessica, the new secretary, started on June 22nd. With Sandy's help, we may be continuing to take the service on YouTube and Facebook for the 1030 to record the service. We'll see how that goes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you can provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference, differences and we do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical obedience, obedience of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, you direct our lives by your grace, and your words of justice and mercy reshape the world. Mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Romans. Do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you have entrusted, and that you have been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking human terms because of your natural limitations. 
For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God. The advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of the prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly, I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin this morning by asking you to recall a memory. I'd like you to recall a time in your life when you witnessed a great act of hospitality or help, something you've experienced. Um, it might be a time way back at your grandmother's house or you were out of town and someone ex ex a, um, um, extended uh, hospitality to you. How were you received? What did they do to make you feel special? And why did they do it? Because the answers to those questions you can still remember today. I won't ask you to share those memories. Maybe as you sit at home, uh, you might do that. But I'd like to share mine. And I have numerous memories of acts of kindness and help in my life. I think back to, I think it was November 1979. It was Friday after Thanksgiving. My family was moving from the parsonage on Burke Street to uh, where we lived nine years to North Coventry, where we've been living for 40 years. And members of the church came and helped us move. Boxes, furniture, everything was packed in this big truck and members had pickup trucks. Um, I don't remember all the names. I know remember Joe Degley, Ron Forsythe, Ron Matthews, his son Mark, Frank Desperate and others were just a tremendous help giving a day of their life and probably had back aches the next day. But their kindness was very appreciated. But something even more prevalent today, a memory that I have, and I'll always remember, I thank Sandy Levengood for these 15 weeks of taping the service so that you could uh, participate and watch the service at home. Sandy giving up 15 Tuesday mornings and learning how to do this with Facebook and YouTube. It's a great, great uh, help to us. But the lesson this morning from Matthew's Gospel is a lesson on hospitality. Jesus is so focused on welcoming the stranger and he uses the word welcome six times in two sentences. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's rewards. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of a righteous person. Explicit in the words of Jesus is the promise that if you show hospitality, you will get a prize. 
In fact, you get the same prize as the person receiving your hospitality. Here's how it works. If you offer a meal to a prophet like Jeremiah, who is a great prophet, by the way, then you will get the, whatever the reward that Jeremiah will get, which would be probably a pretty substantial reward. And if you offer a, 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 ride, a ride to a righteous person, uh, Billy Graham, of course, passed away, but if you uh, offered a reward to him or help to him, then you would get that reward. So it seems that the real challenge in this life is to figure out who the important people are, who the important people will get big rewards in heaven and show hospitality to them. I mean, why waste your time showing hospitality to John Smolik when you could show hospitality maybe to Bishop Patricia Davenport, our synod bishop, or other famous people? That's the logical conclusion of Jesus' words today in this gospel. That is, until you read the last verse in the gospel lesson, when Jesus throws us a big curve, did you hear it? Whoever gives a cup of water to one of these little ones, truly I tell you, none of these will ever lose their reward. The point Jesus is making is this. If there is something to be gained by showing hospitality, it's not hospitality. If we are only kind to those of wealth and power, it's not hospitality, it's bribery. If we only show hospitality to our relatives and friends, it's just paying them back. But Jesus says, if you, if you so much as give, excuse me, give a glass of water to a child, you will never lose your reward. Well, you're probably saying, what's so special about that, Pastor? You have to remember, in Jesus' day, children were of little value, or no value. They were considered property or even slaves. People did not walk around town with signs on the back on their backs uh, saying, my kid is an honor student at Jerusalem Middle School. Children were nobody in that culture. And there was nothing to be gained by being nice to them. And yet Jesus says that that is the ultimate act of kindness. This, Jesus says, is hospitality when you care for one of these little ones. Look at scripture. In almost every instance, when Jesus is speaking about kindness, uh, generosity or hospitality or welcome, he isn't describing what ought to be done for the rich or the famous or the powerful. He is saying this ought to be done for the powerless ones, the children, the grieving, uh, people who are discouraged, uh, the desperate. If you show hospitality to these little ones, your reward will never be lost. You probably already know that the word hospitality comes from the Latin word hospital. Throughout most of history, a hospital was not a place where someone went to be healed. It's not until our lifetime a hospital wasn't a place we went for some life-saving surgery. Hospital was a place to be comforted, a place to be fed, loved, and touched and cared for. Another word for the same root has shown up in our contemporary speech in recent years, and of course, is the word hospice. The purpose of hospice workers is not to cure the patients, but it's to give them comfort as humanly possible, what is called palliative care. Hospice workers are in fact angels in disguise, and their real, real reward, as Jesus promises, will be great. 
It seems to me that God calls the church to be a hospice to the hurting people of the world. Instead of spending much of our time and energy pointing out people's sins or criticizing people for their flaws or condemning them for their lifestyle and excluding them from um, uh, becoming religious like us, instead of judging them, hasn't God called us to be loving them? Hasn't God called us to be on the lookout for the weakest, the oldest, uh, the youngest, the poorest, or the most lonely in our society and offer them a cup of water? God calls us to make them comfortable, but if it makes us uncomfortable, we often ignore the call, don't we? And I think that breaks God's heart. Have you noticed the past three months as we've been sheltering at home, people in our neighborhood seems to be more friendly? You sit outside or you walk, or if you have a dog, you walk them. People seem to go by and they say hello. You might not know them, but at least there's a greeting. I think if there's any good that has come out of this virus and this sheltering for three months is that people have been uh, friendlier. People you don't, you don't even know in your neighborhood. And maybe you're even getting to know your own neighbor. A lot of, some of us have porches in our front of the house, but many of us don't. We have decks in our backyard. We have fun fences, and that seems to insulate us. But I believe that God blesses the people and ministries of congregations as we plan to continue regular worship in these difficult times when we take seriously this command of hospitality. But if God has a porch in heaven, I bet it's right there in the front street and he can help as people go by. He knows those their circumstances and he acts to help and not just a cup of water, but a bucket full, not just to fix problems, not to cure their diseases, but just to simply show kindness, to, sh to show grace, to show hospitality. I close with this. In our lives, when it comes to hospitality, we take turns being the host and being the guest. Sometimes we are the ones who simply need a cup of water, uh, an act of kindness in our lives because of something we're going through. And then other times we are the ones providing the hot dish or the coffee or the comfort in some way. We all know people with the gift of hospitality, people who send cards or call or desserts or when a family member dies to show comfort in one way or another. Giving a drink of water when a person is needed, when needs it the most. And I think the adage is true. Everything that goes around comes around. And when we receive the cups of water we pour, we will receive them and your presence at funerals or um, people that need your help or offering even a sandwich or a call in time of need, that cup of water in the name of a righteous person is what this message in our gospel is all about. Thanks be to God. Amen. With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. 
he ascended into heaven and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. God of companionship, encourage our relationships with our siblings in Christ, bless our conversations, share our, uh, shape our shared future and give us hearts eager to join in the festal sh shout to you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of abundance, you, you make your creation thrive and grow to provide all that we need. Inspire us to care for our environment and to be in tune to where the earth is crying out. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of mercy, your grace is poured out for all. Inspire authorities, judges, and politicians to act with compassion. Teach us to overcome fear with hope, to meet hate with love, and welcome one another as we would welcome you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of care, accompany all who are in the deepest need. Comfort those who are sick, lonely, or abandoned, especially those we name in our hearts. Those will undergo a hospital procedures this week. We ask for your healing power and strength for Frank. Strengthen those who are in prison or awaiting trial. Renew the spirits of all who call upon you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of community, we, we give thanks for this congregation. Give us passion to embrace your mission and the vision to recognize where you are leading us. Teach us how to live more faithfully with each other. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Gracious God, bless the people and ministries of our congregation as we plan to resume regular worship next Sunday as regularly as possible with all the guidelines. In these strange and difficult days of the coronavirus, give us fresh ways of being nurtured and nourished in your word and strengthened in our fellowship. Instill in us to see others as your children and not to be racist in our attitudes and actions in our society today. Bless all law enforcement personnel with compassion as they perform their service to our communities. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of love, you gather in your embrace all who have died. Keep us steadfast in our faith and renew our trust in your promise. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.